Voila! And we're live with no viewers. That doesn't. Oh, there we go. <laughs> it bumped up. Okay. I feel, need, I feel we need some music, Max, when you know. Oh, I thought there was music, though. Well, anyway. So, anyway, we have a, a good show this time. This is the 51th episode. And it's a Q&A where we asked out on Twitter, Facebook, etc. But only on Twitter we got uh, answers to get... Oh, sorry, we got some questions. Um, and Steve Pohl is... Steve, what, how do you say last name, actually? How do I say my last name? It's is it Pool. Pool. Steve Pool. Yeah. yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, so you're going to host us today. And for everyone who's listening in... Uh, feel free to ask questions in the chat. We might see if we can fit them into. We have, I don't know, like 20 questions? We have exactly 20. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but anyone who's have follow-up questions that are just ask in while we're doing it, and then we'll see how it goes. So, uh, cool. Well, over to you, Steve. And, uh, okay. We'll see how it goes. Well, we didn't do this one. I've got to put this one up. Ta-da! Crocus Eye, because they're yes. there. Uh, so we have 20 questions, as you said, Max, that we gathered from the community. Um, and I'm going to run through them. I'm just going to do the easy bit and ask the questions, and maybe I'll poke on things as, as if and things come up. Um, right now, some people who've submitted, you may see your question. It may not be exactly worded the way you submitted it, uh, and that may be because I've tried to make it a little bit more specific, or um, some of the questions are just too long for this software. So um, there's a 120, 120 character limit on some of these things, which we just found out. So let's start with the most important question, is this one, which is what I'm going to ask is, so panel, why have we got a 2.0? Well, because it's one number higher than one. <laughs> no. Uh, we are bored of one max all the time. <laughs> Wanted to switch it up. Well, Jason, do you want to take that one? Sure. So um, basically, it, our general philosophy with Quarkus releases is that we're very like time box oriented. So that's why, you know, it's like 1.0 all the way. Well, actually, I think we started at 0. Dot something. I can't remember the exact version. And then uh, 1.x all the way uh, through to 13 now. Um, and with, with where things change with two is that we wanted to make a really big change with bringing in uh, Vertex, so Ver Vertex 4. And then we're doing a lot of uh, architectural changes around that. So we have a great, uh, it's it's actually been available uh, as an experimental module, but uh, now we, th we think it's it's ready to go. It's called uh, REST Easy Reactive. And that's firmly based off the Vertex 4 architecture. So because we're making these big moves, we felt that it was time for a 2.0. Um, now, of course, that doesn't mean that when you go from one to two, that it's going to be this, you know, painful experience. We've been thinking about that. We've tried to make it as painless as possible. So think of it as a very special 1.14. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, so that gives me, because I've already got this question lined up, which was how compatible is two with the previous one? We've got one. Yeah, so as, as Jason is saying is for the end user, there should be little to very any uh, significant difference. There might be a few extensions that are change a few things, but nothing as nothing different that we've done in like between one twelve and one eleven, etc. Where the the incompatibility comes is on the who those who written extensions. Uh, mainly, I think it's the Vertex. Um, uh, there's a change in Vertex that, that a slight change that every extension writer has, well, almost every extension writer had to do. Um, and then, of course, the one thing that we, I think Jason actually forgot is that we dropped Java 8 support. Oh, so if, yes. you are, if you are on Java 8, you you have to ha either have to stay on, on Quarkus 113 or update to at least Java 11 um, and move forward uh, with that. Right? Um, and then the other one we also did was to be upgrading from MicroProfile ah, 3 to 4. Is that the number? <laughs> um, and that might also change a few things, but again, on the user and user, I don't think there should be uh, anything uh, of notice uh, on compatibility uh, wise. So. Yeah, so basically, unless you're in your application, you've been like going down to the vertex level, you probably won't see any differences. 
Um, well, then there are other extensions that have some breaking changes, like just with just as the same as most Quarkus releases, various extensions like deprecated stuff or remove stuff or whatever. Um, so there might be slightly more changes than a usual uh, Quarkus release, but nothing, um, nothing earth shattering. Okay, so well, that's good to hear because we're all used to. Oh, we've all had experiences of software where going from one to two means just start again, and um, and you're you're paying really close attention to not asking the the developers to do that, which is you know which is the right answer. Okay, so uh, I have. Yeah, yeah. And, and I just want to be I want to be honest and clear here. If you come from if you started with Quarkus, let's say one o, and you want to update to two like the one o o to two o, you might have a bigger shift. But if you've been following th uh, uh, our updates, that should have you know we have the migration guide to walk through and see anything that's been you know uh, changes. Been. Well, I, yeah. just I think like with any modern like software you, you you can't really expect to skip 10 releases and go from a release that was well, a year ago so it's 12 releases ago to a release that's like modern yeah. and have yeah. no changes at all yeah and you know let's be honest in mod in a modern world running an old software even if it's you know something new and fabulous as Quarkus, is not always the right thing to do so keeping up to date is just a safe bet yeah Okay, so I have one more question for me, and then, which is a two, and then we're going to go into the things we're getting from the web. So, this is just the last in the two point oh one because people, I know some people will be interested in this. The move to two point oh, uh, does it signify anything else in terms of uh, moving to anything more mature in terms of release cadence, or are you happy with what you've got? And so, therefore, when does the next one appear after two point zero? So, uh, well, uh, the, the simple answer is no. There's no plan on changing the release cadence. Uh, once the 2.0 GA, uh, sorry, 2.0 final comes out, we, we plan on going back to about a month's regular uh, release schedule. Um, the, the one thing that might be is that we actually were planning on doing a, a 2.0 final today, but we reviewed the feedback from community and kind of all the dependency of, uh, sorry, the extensions, if they have up to date, and there was a few key ones that was missing. Um, so we are doing a, a CR three, but shortly, hopefully next week, we'll have the. Uh, I think it was next. I forgot. I now I forgot the action schedule. <laughs> but oh. we, we we added a CR three for a bit more big time. Um, but then once the two O comes out, the plan is to go back to to what's there. Um, and uh, on the wiki, on the migration, uh, on the wiki. Um, the Quarkus Wiki, Quarkus Repo Wiki, there is a page called the Release Plan, and in there you'll see the next uh, couples, and uh, I think up to two two, and um, yeah, so okay, that's what. cool. Okay, so yeah. if anybody there are not any more specific two point zero questions on here, but if anybody has more, then stick them in the chat and we'll see if we can get to them. Uh, so now we're going to go through because there is some structure to these questions. We're going to go through. So a questions that people are raised about just Quarkus features in general. So the first one, this is not from me, um, is from uh, Lewis, who says, why is Kotlin support so much behind? Well, well it's, I'd like to know what that means, first of all. Yeah. Well, I think, um, well, until, I don't know how, like a few months ago, well, about a month ago, we had a, we may, were missing coroutines, but I believe that's now in. Uh, uh, yeah, we have coroutine support yeah. for a lot of things now. Yeah. And I think there's dev mode had some issues, but I believe they've all been fixed. Um, so, like, based if if Lewis tried Kotlin like six months ago, yes, there was some gaps, but. Um, We've had uh, Jason Lee working quite hard on, on on closing those gaps, and I believe is it Justin. three weeks? Ju sorry, Justin, just, Justin, Justin, <laughs> Justin. Sorry, sorry, Justin Lee. Um, uh, about three weeks from now, we are actually doing a Kotlin episode on Quarkus Insights, uh, where I'm pretty sure we'll have more details on on 
what is missing, if anything. <laughs> so uh, that, that's that's the right answer, Max. You're going to do a QI thing about it, but is there any? Yeah. Where does Kotlin sit as far as the importance to the Quarkus development team? Well, it's a, well uh, Java is the most important one, but Kotlin is definitely the close second. Um, and that's is indicated by, you know, Jason. Oh, we lost Jason Green. <laughs> I so, asked the wrong question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you didn't like the question, Jason? So... Uh, <laughs> Jason, no, I can't so, hear you. Yeah, you're on mute, yeah. Jason. Yeah. yeah. Well, anyway, while while Jason can't talk, um, no, no, the point is that uh, we actually, again, a few months back, we said, you know what, we want to get the cutlet up, and Justin Lee, I think he's more or less full time on making sure all those gaps get closed. Um, and the best thing we can do is is get re user reports about specifics that's missing. Uh, but in 2.0, there should be a lot of those gaps that's been the last year has been uh, closed down. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So, uh, yeah. Lewis has another question for you, which is around <laughs> something else, which is around, um, he's sort of moaning about Gradle. Is Gradle oh, a second-class tool on Quarkus? Yeah, Jason, are you, does, does it work yeah. now for you? <laughs> okay. Um, you can hear me or no? Yes, yes. I, I can hear you. Okay, awesome. You know. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I, I, Chrome decided to flake out on me. So um, my yeah, apologies. No problem. Um, well, I, I can I can do the Gradle one. So again, uh, Maven is the one that we do first because that's the primary one we have. We do uh, do everything we can to make sure every feature we cover in Maven is in Gradle and vice versa. <clears throat> Uh, and again, there's been in the last couple of months, there's been a lot of uh, follow-ups, uh, follow uh, uh, work in the community on closing the gaps. So as far as I know right now, Gradle is very close on, like I don't know of any major differences. I know there's is, the things Gradle can do that we don't utilize fully, but compared like Maven, Maven support for Quarkus, Maven uh, Gradle support, as far as I know, we are on, on at least very close on par now. Um, so again, I, at this point, I would say to be a, we haven't, mar Gradle is still marked as experimental, but I think soon we want to make that as a, hey, now it's, it's full. Um, so anyone out there who are using the latest version of Quarkers and still see issues with Gradle, please open up issues. That's the, the, the best way we can, can do on, the, on doing that. Yeah, um, and, and that the same for, for Kotlin as well. And that you know, obviously, for anything that you find broken or is not yeah up to speed, but for Gradle and Kotlin specifically, then raise issues, turn up on Zulip, say yeah. your piece, I, tell us why it is it's not doing what you want. Yeah. So, okay, um, right. So the question is coming. Lewis has one more, and we're not doing this in order of. Um, who submitted them? There is some structure to this. It just happens that Lewis's ones are all turning up in this sort of. Oh, safe actually, way. just one thing I just yeah. saw that uh, oh, yeah. Hiro was the climate actually pointed out that I actually wasn't aware that mm. the Cardinal byte code for Cobra team was not supported by Graal VM. It's been added re recently. Um, yeah. So yeah. yeah so, so that, that means one reason we we never really put any effort into it prior to a few months ago, right? Yeah, because the Kotlin couldn't actually run in native mode. Yes, that was the, the coroutines, not not Kotlin no, itself. No, no, coroutines. Coroutines, yes. Oh, so, so yeah, that, that, but that's Kotlin using oh. Graal, not you, not its own native support. Yes, it's yeah. Kotlin using. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now George has gone offline. Oh, <laughs> oh back in there. Okay, right. So, as the Lewis, <laughs> Lewis oh, where's the question? Right. So, this is a much better question. So, this is again for Lewis. Any plan in having a proper, quote, reactive JDBC only library similar to Spring Data JDBC or Micronaut Data JDBC? Well, so I don't know, Jason, you have, I, I have an answer to it, but. Were you saying yeah, that? well, I was. So we what we have is uh, <clears throat> we have uh, support for Hibernate Reactive, um, which gives you like the power and flexibility of you know an ORM layer, but in a reactive fashion. So it is 
proper reactive. Uh, but you know, you, you, in the question, it sounds like you're looking for JDBC only. So we actually have like uh, the support the, we, the underlying JDBC drivers we have. We have Vertex JDBC drivers for things, and they ha- are also optimal, pure, reactive. So you could actually use those directly if you wanted to. But um, I think you'll be very happy with Hibernate because you get um, a lot more expressive, uh, you know, queries and capabilities. And a lot of people think that well. You know, if, if I just use JDBC straight, um, I can, you know, that's, uh, there's things I can't do with Hibernate that I could do that way. And and if you look at it through Hibernate, it actually lets you do everything that you can do in JDBC. It just gives you more features. So um, yeah, I would like, recommend taking a look at it. Yeah, exactly. Because the, we had actually an episode of Quark, I don't know, like five, 10 episodes back about efficient data access with Quarkers. And that was actually me showing Hibernate and how to use Hibernate, but it was just pure SQL and JDBC like interfaces. Um, yeah, I think that's that's what right? the question was about, right? The, yeah, and that's one. and that's like so. If you go and look on on Hibernate Reactive, it has stateless session, it has mm-hmm. create native query, it has um, uh, store. I'm not sure store procedure support is there, but it has all the same interfaces. So all the stuff you can do on on plain Hibernate. And I'm not talking entities uh, or JPA, or et cetera. I'm talking like raw, here's a SQL query. Give me those entity, oh, sorry, item, uh, podios, basically, <laughs> uh, back. Or as a map or anything, you can do. Uh, so definitely check out Hyperactive. That is the closer you'll get to to the the, the Spring DataBC, Micronaut DataBC uh, at, at the moment. Uh, I, I owe an explanation why I dropped off. And he, here it is. <laughs> Oh, oh, you got your shirt. Yeah, just arrived. <laughs> I'm so jealous. I'm still waiting. Yeah. I got mine today, too. I don't have it on because it's a bit, the sizes are a bit different. And can, uh, can you hold it up again, George, please? Cool. So if anybody wants one of those who doesn't work for Red Hat, then the best way to get one is to get yourself on one of the Quarkers World Tour gigs, which you can find a list of, or get your local jug to ask for one if they're not on the list. Because part of that is maybe we'll get to send you a T-shirt. Cool. Okay, plug over. Right. Um, are we finished? Do we want to move on to the next one? I, I think so, yeah. That yeah. So I'm going to post a link in the chat if you guys are interested in the pure Vertex uh, drivers for those as well. If, the, if, if you really sure. don't want to look at Hibernate. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. So the next one, somebody new. Um, Sapal, I think. Chris, do we have streaming file uploading quarkers just like Micronauts? Um, well, this really depends on what the person is asking for. But if, if they are, if they they say what I think they are saying, uh, then in Quarkus 2.0, um, with the new um, reactive REST client we have, uh, we have multi-part, multi-part file upload support uh, that's uh, based on what Vertex does, so it's fully non-blocking, streaming, all that uh, awesome stuff. Um, so yeah, Quarkus 2.0 will get you that. Basically, um, the, the idea is that with Quarkus 2.0, we now, like Jason said at the beginning, we have m- almost a complete story of like reactive end-to-end that's actually super easy to use, right? Um, so you, you get the, the REST client interfaces, um, so you can use them easily, but like, uh, uh, the implementation is all based on vertex instead of like thread pools and all that, uh, nasty stuff that, um, doesn't scale well. So bet you should definitely check out the reactive rest client, um, which is like the replacement of the original rest client we had, we still have in Quarkus. Cool. So, so the answer is yes. Yes. And okay. like Clement says, obviously. Uh, he's saying in the chat that yeah. up until now, uh, there is no Unix. There has, there was no Unix support for truly non-blocking file system I/O. Uh, now, as he mentions, that will likely change in the, f- the coming years with I/O Uring. Uh, hopefully, we'll see support th- for that broadly. But yeah, now if you're like, even if you're using like Node.js or like, and you think everything is non-blocking, well, it's not in the file system. Yeah. Uh, there's a thread pool that handles that. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, cool. it's 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 kind of arbitrary too because you could do like async file IO, and you could do something like you can hit a directory block, like you're just trying to like list files in an entry, and then suddenly your file system will block, and then it can depend too if you have like a lot of activity happening at the same time. So uh, most systems try to abstract it with the thread pool yeah. to keep it to keep it safe. So if you happen to be like looking at your system and you see those extra threads, it's actually helping you out. Um, you know, until we get that native async support. Okay, excellent. Cool. Uh, right, so moving on, uh, Vol made a comment which I thought we'd share before we are bringing his question up. Our team loves Crocus. Looking forward to the next major version, which is really soon. Yeah. Oh, too old. Yeah. So, so Vol's question, and I think you may have answered this, but we let's dig into this. Which microprofile version is supported? So yeah, Quarkus 2.0 will have Verta and will have Microprofile 4 support. Um, well, 113 is what at one at 32 or something like that. I don't remember the exact version. Yeah. Okay. Right, and, and one thing to keep in mind about when when it comes to like what versions of these things does Quarkus support? Um, Quarkus isn't a uh, just my just about Microprofile, right? Like Quarkus, like I would look at Quarkus as Microprofile implementation that's just we have a few of the apis that people like to use that are microprofile apis we have some spring apis that developers like to use so it's really more about like giving you guys like the latest technology as fast as we can um so like we may have some stuff from microprofile 4 but that doesn't mean we're going to hold ourselves back to microprofile 4 if a new you know a new version of uh, rest technology comes out we will will update to that um so Basically, I would look at it from the perspective of instead of like the micro profile, look at it as what's the what's the technology I want to use? Like, what version of the Rust technology are you guys using? That that that's a better way to think about it. Yeah, yeah. I think you just made the point about what's really important is keeping up with the technology and and not being held back by some of these standards. Yeah. Okay. Um. So the next one. So I thought, Mike, that question is. Pretty straightforward. The next one, interesting. So Carlos digging more into features. So he says, is there any support for Jackson plus Java records already? And I wasn't quite sure how to parse that. So I'll let you have a go at parsing it and tell me what you think it means. Yeah. Well, I don't, um, oh, go, go, ahead, go, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I'll just say what he what he means is the Java the was Java fourteen that had Java records where you can have these you know, small classes, no getter and setters. You just declare the the structure. And uh, my understanding is that Jackson the library has initial support for it, but I don't know if we have done Quarkus. Uh, we have anything specifically in Quarkus, so that George, you might know better for that. Uh, in Quarkus, we have not. We have yet to do any specific work for records. Uh, probably because like we, we're really the really important thing for this release was to get um the vertex four out and all the stuff that, that entails uh but yeah i assume that um we'll be able we'll be looking at it soon so you can, mean, yeah so with java records being something where you construct a record and obviously everything then's immutable is that right or you just get properties filled in it's a mutable it's yeah. a mutable Data class is the yeah. Right. So a lot of it. So in which case, a lot of this is just simply down to Jackson updating to read the data in and then create the object in one go, rather than possibly prop propagate it with fields and things. So it yeah. may not really be much to do with Quarkus. Well, on the Jackson side, yeah, there shouldn't be. Um, like on other stuff, like we would probably want. Like ideally, like people are asking for, uh, how do I use records with Hibernate and stuff like that. That is definitely something that we would yeah. we would need, or like for um, reactive messaging. Uh, how would I use like uh, reactive messaging for something? The the, the 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 payload being a record and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, those are definitely things we need to look into. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So it, just to keep in mind, uh, it's important. Oh, it looks like actually Clement just made it um, that in order to use records, you need Java sixteen and um, the the problem is is that the current uh, native image is based off technology. If you're going to do native images, is based off of Java 11. So um, mm -hmm. you could probably get it to work with JVM mode, but then if you wanted to do natives, you, 
we, we'd have to wait a bit for uh, native image to update to, to 16. Otherwise, it should work. It should work fine. And another thing I'll mention too is that we have some core introspection technology in Quarkus that's part of extension developers. And we don't have like some significant support for records yet. So people try to do really fancy, if an extension wants to do a really fancy thing with records, uh, we need to do a little bit of work there to make it possible. Like if you wanted to find them and do something interesting. Um, so, uh, but that'll be coming soon. And Phillips men mentions in the chat that, well, Philip is uh, part of the Quarks team as well, um, and he's been on the show, but he mentions that uh, GraphQL already supports uh, records, which is cool. Wow. Bleeding edge. Yeah. Sorry, okay. I was muted. And then uh, Hi Hibernate, you have this, Hibernate has a select new construct. I believe that works with records too, and you can also add uh, pro uh, what's called a result transformer that creates records. Um, so yeah, you can you can hook it in in some places, but uh, yeah, for Jackson, you're waiting for Jackson to finalize theirs. Yeah. Okay, so uh, that was that. Then uh, we have Sumanth uh, moaning just a little bit and trying to figure out whether it's his problem or their problem or your problem. So I lost the colorful logs after upgrading to Quarkus 200 CR1. Did I miss any config changes? So on that one, I, uh, I actually asked Shuma, Shuma to open an issue because I couldn't reproduce the thing. I think he had a screen sh uh, sh screenshot from IntelliJ or something. Um, uh, so he might not have missed the conflict change. So, uh, we did for continuous testing, which is the, one of the big features in 2.0, we did add some additional processing of the terminal output. And in there, there might have been, we're trying to detect what environment you're in to handle like new lines and uh, rendering the stuff correctly. And there we might have missed something, uh, but it's important. So if you have this issue, please uh, report the issue and tell us what OS you're on, what terminal window you're running it in, and what if you're wrapping it inside uh, an IDE like Eclipse or IntelliJ or Visco, let us know because all those parameters changes how a terminal behaves. Um, so it might be that we there's some edge case we haven't caught. So do do please open it up. Yeah, cool. Okay, right. So I I have a question for you because we've had a lot of conversations up here. Questions about about features uh, and people asking you about what's what's could be coming. So a couple more two zero questions for you. So here's the first one, and this is just be interested in your opinions. So I'm sure you're all excited about getting two point zero out the door. Um, what's your opinion? What What is it that you like most? What's the one feature that you think is, you know, cool, fantastic, going to change people's lives or just fun? This is a really hard question. This is the, probably the hardest question in the set. <laughs> <laughs> There's some great stuff, but I think co continuous testing is pretty impressive. Yeah. If you guys haven't had yeah. a chance to look at it, I mean, it really changes the way uh, you can develop stuff. You can, you can actually write your test first to do test driven development style and do really complicated stuff like uh, reactive uh, database interactions, hybrid aid, entities, all that stuff. And it will just magically run the tests for you as you're coding and you don't ever have to lift your fingers off the keyboard. So that's my favorite, uh, that my favorite feature in 2.0 if I had to pick one, but they're all like, I would like rest easy reactive. We were just talking about that's also awesome, right? Because I mean, you're talking like really high, uh, you know, really high performance and not just for reactive settings, but also in blocking settings. So it's, uh, I mean, and, and here's the cool thing. You can write blocking code in REST Easy Reactive and it'll actually detect it and tell you, oh, hey, you, you forgot to add blocking and so that it can wrap the triple. And did you mean to, or did you mean for it to be reactive? So it's a really awesome framework. So, uh, I, I, you know, I could go out, you guys probably name about three others that are, that are great too. <laughs> Well, I know what the Kotlin folks are going to say is their most is their favorite feature, coroutine support. That's true. But what's and yours? Then, mine? Oh, mine yeah. is continuous testing for sure. <laughs> yeah. I, I'll say the the my favorite one. If I can't choose uh, continuous testing, is probably the the move to Java eleven. Just the fact that we can start using a bit more of the newer APIs uh, there. And a, a year from now, I'll be. Sad we can't use Java 17, but let's let's see how that goes. Um, 
Well, yeah, no, I think the, the move to Java 11 uh, not only enables us to do things better and faster, but also like all the users who now are encouraged to move to Java 11, hopefully also get a better VM to run on. That, uh, yeah. So, and an API. So, that's right. So, um, I mean, yeah. I, I think the continuous testing stuff is just awesome. And, and I'm sure everybody else will. Yeah. And you can tell because. You know, sometimes you you somebody will show you something that you hadn't even thought about being possible, and they show it to you, and you go, "That's fantastic." But then you go, "I want more." And so George and I have been talking. We we you know, part of the Ward Tour stuff. We've been talking about the continuous testing and this, and you go, "Yeah, this is great, but we want more." You know, so it's great. We really want more anyway. Yeah. And, okay. and, and by the way, it's another one that uh, again as a. I know like, the Quarkus 2, there's a stuff, a lot of other stuff we're doing, like upgrading Java version, the Vertex stuff, and, uh, and micro profile. And I know there's details. Uh, Clement probably, we should brought Clement on since he's chatting so much in the text here. <laughs> um, uh, that, that we can highlight. Uh, but a lot of developer joy just suddenly came into 2 .0. So there's the devs, uh, sort of the continuous testing. Um, uh, there's improvements in the dev UI. There are the, the the terminal we now have with continuous testing. We can now control hot reload and hot uh, restart. I'm sure we add more to it. There is the navigation from um, st uh, stack. All well, that came in one later, one eleven thirteen. Being able to navigate from code to the IDE, uh, but then there's also dev services where we can like base. If you don't have any configuration with your database, we will create one for you. And run a Docker instance um, in 2.0. I think <clears throat> we will also have that for Kafka. Uh, Clement mm -hmm. can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and oh, and and uh, Clement talked about Avro. Yeah, oh, the the generation uh, of uh, services. Yes, that was cool. So um, basically, my, my summary here is like if you haven't seen Quarkus in like six months. Um, then you definitely need to take a very, very fresh look at Quarks. There's because there's been so many things that have gone in in the last six months that it really just changes everything. Well, I'd yeah. say if you don't keep up to date on a release by release basis, you're going to miss stuff out because there's, there's so much good stuff coming. And but I just I just thought I was a question about dev services from Javi Toya. Things I like a lot the new Quarkus Dev Services. I like to know if possible to add more services apart from databases like mock servers or custom resources. Yes, I couldn't we find any guide. I believe well, we had the hooks, but it's just not documented yet. Yeah, it's so, not yeah. documented because basically it's just like us adding stuff now. But um, yeah, yeah, we should uh, it, probably. It's, it's on the if roadmap. You, yeah, and if you want to start, like if you want to jumpstart and do it now, just reach us, reach out to us on chat and we can point you in the right direction if you want to start writing code now doing yeah. that okay but right, so now i have a small number of questions about something that always comes up and that's the p word the performance word so i need to ask this because other people of course want to know this is is caucus 2.0 faster than 1.0 Jason, that's for you. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, you know, if, if from the description I was telling you about with uh, like Rest Easy Reactive, then the answer is uh, yes. So essentially what we've we've done is we've um, we've always had with Quarkus, we've always had reactive and imperative as basically use. But we, we, we treat both paradigms as important and, and fun to do. And then under the hood, we, we map everything to reactive. So basically, if you prefer imperative style, you still get reactive performance with the imperative style. I mean, technically, the reactive, if you write in reactive, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be better because you can, um, you know, you can actually just integrate directly and run have code that's executing right on the IO thread, and you're not going back and forth to a thread pool for, for your actions that you need to do. But everything that Quarkus does under the hood, whenever it actually gets to rendering to the from the web server or uh, talking to the database, when you're using these reactive technologies, that's all done in a non blocking um, fashion. So uh, between two and one, the biggest difference is that we've we've moved all the way. We've moved all the pieces, and that's been our vision from the beginning. Um, it's so so yes. Yeah, so from that perspective, it is uh, it is certainly faster. We do optimize the frameworks um, significantly um, from really from all angles. Uh, 
Uh, in fact, I mentioned that um, that the the frameworks themselves that went into Quarkus they they didn't they didn't just start at Quarkus. They were actually projects that we had before um, that had great like maturity and experience on them. So we, you know, we have a really fast thread pull implementation, um, that was already around that we pulled into, into Quarkus, for example. Um, and it's something that we look at all the time. And I think you'll find that if you look at Quarkus, how Quarkus performs from just about any angle, it really is supersonic. So that's, you know, that, that's why we say supersonic subatomic Java, because you get the, that space and you get that runtime performance across the stack. And I believe if you go back to one, oh, like as a year ago, uh, ever since and to now, we've also spent a lot of time uh, on the stuff that uh, Jason talked about, but on the, like, we have the Tech Empower um, benchmark, and we are now in the top of that, uh, which I don't think we were at 1.0, but somewhere in, in 1.0 and after, we, we got better. So that's always been a, a thing we do, and yeah, 2 that, there's no major bump in 2.0, it's just to continue in the same way of just improving and optimizing whatever we find uh, that that is an optimal. And, uh, yeah. yeah, you know one thing I can mention um, that it just give you an example because it sounds like <laughs> sounds like yeah. a, you know my answer might have sound like a lot of fluff. Um, but to get, to get real specific, um, like when you write an application and you use like the REST Easy Reactive framework, what it actually does is it compiles all the paths that you express in your application. So if you have a bunch of resources, they're all bound at a bunch of different locations. It actually creates a path matching algorithm specific to your app when it builds it. And then that's all built on top of the reactive stack. So you're actually getting a custom pre-optimized version of your application when you are developing with this. So it's actually real, there is actually real gains here that I'm talking about. Okay. Yeah, because that that's the that's the, the that code is on the path when you like hit the browser and it needs to resolve the path. That is it's like every every pro, every uh, request will hit that code, and now it's optimized beyond what you would do by hand, basically. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're talking comparing 1.0 to 2.0, one thing you would see is like if you wrote code that where you went straight down to Vertex, you would be uh, you'd see the like in Tech and Power, for example, you see that you see the Vertex scenarios really really high on that list. But then once you would start to use some of the higher layer levels of the stack, like you would start to use um, our, you know. Uh, say JAX or S APIs, then it, the performance would degrade a bit, and it's because like the tech, the spec itself has all these features with matching paths and all these things that add a lot of overhead, and and so that's gone with REST Easy React. Like when you actually compare, you can write the same exact application performs the same as if you were doing a vertex uh, straight direct application. Um, so it, it it it's a big jump from from one to two. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Jason. Not too much hand waving there, but just. <laughs> So, <laughs> so Max mentioned this. Um, he said this word. So I'm going to bring up the question, and this is from Jay. Um, uh, and so this is there's a things here to talk about. But the specific question was any benchmarking against a Jin-based GoLang microservice. So, I think mean, Jin's the HTTP server. So, so that brings up the question. So I presume you're going to tell me the answer is no. Or, uh, I don't know. Do you know, Jason? Have we done any? Um, no, so we don't. Um, <laughs> so we care a lot about performance. So I, I would say, like, when we talk about tech and power, that actually compares against lots of languages and runtimes. So it's not just Java only. Um, and so we do see, like, other technologies in that list. So we look at it from that angle. We haven't specifically targeted competing with Gen. I could talk a little bit about some of the architectural sort of similarities and differences in that, you know, with Golang, there's the, the notion of, um, you know, they have a set and they, they have a fixed pool of threads, which is effectively equivalent to what we have in Vertex. We have a set, we have a set of event threads that, that you can, that execute directly in a reactive fashion. Um, you know, there's a, a, a native compilation output that you get from Golang, and that's exactly the same thing you get uh, from Quarkus. Uh, usually in a lot of these performance tests, um, Java has had an advantage over Go frameworks in in the past, but I know Go has has made a lot of advancements um, on the runtime front. So, like if you're running like say JVM mode, JVM has like the you know one of the best JIT engines in you know for in any across any language technology. So it tends to kind of edge things out um, you know on on that front. Uh, but uh, when we're talking like from a native 
from a native image standpoint. Um, I think you probably find, you know, comparative with, uh, you know, ahead of time compilation outputs being similar. Um, so we haven't done a direct comparison. Um, but what I would encourage you to do is go ahead and do it yourself, right? Like uh, just write your application. Make sure though that when you compare with Go, that you are doing a real apples to apples comparison yeah, with. Because exactly. one of the things I find when I use Go is that like uh, it's uh, Java. It seems like there's a lot more richer frameworks av available that have you know this extensive depth of APIs. And then when you go and you use like a Go framework, it'll be like a whole bunch of small ones, and you have to pick say between ten you know, REST, REST frameworks and they come and go, you know, every, every so often. Um, so just make sure that when you're comparing that you're, you don't compare like say just the pure HTTP server and then, mm -hmm. and then compare that with like the full Quarkus framework stack. Like, if you want to do something like that, then it'd be like, that'd be like comparing Vertex with Jen, for example, and seeing how those two compare. And that would give you like an apples to apples comparison. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just I just for fun, I just went to, to take a bow and just see how, how Jin was in all this stuff. So, so completely, you know, non-scientifically, they have 400 or something entries. Uh, Quarkus is 38 out of, of, uh, of uh, on a number. And it's by Java, Quarkus is by far the highest in the Java space. Uh, and Go is at 160, uh, the Jin one is at 162. Um, so in tech and power, we, we, we are faster, but again, depends on the use case, but yeah. Uh, there. Um, so yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah and we'll, yeah. To, to Jason's point, I mean, some of those ones you see at the top are probably not even frameworks themselves. They're probably just like yeah, optimized for it. twenty lines of code just to spit out the exact result that the benchmark. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. yeah one, of my, one of my favorite ones, like hard coded the actual yeah, SQL exactly. byte sequence. So instead of sending yeah. an SQL statement through an SQL framework, it was literally like the the buffer that gets sent on the wire and it just gets dumped straight to it. So these are yeah. not real applications. I, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah. The benchmarks is something that all developers have some feelings about, don't they? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, I do think it would be good and we could do this on different insight. It'd be really quite interesting to share with the, with the viewers, the, the way that you measure performance and you keep, keep track of what's going on. Well, we, we did actually have one. Uh, John and Jay, you were on one, right? We have we had one where we talked about uh, the performance, how we gather it. Okay, well maybe uh, we do it again then. Yeah. yeah. Right. So I have another performance question. Um, well, it's not a performance question. Um, this is from Dorian, uh, and I think he's he's more interested, I think, in the general aspects of what can you do in terms of performance. Um, Oh, so I'm sorry. I missed out this bit. This is what he was. This is he said. Um, he said he uses Quarkus production. He wants to know if he's doing it well. So he's much more interested. Or most of the questions now are much more interested in uh, guidance than specifics. So go and bring out question fourteen again, which is what about performance optimization and new benchmarks with or reactive? So do you have any guidance for people uh, that? they need in terms of getting the best performance out of Quarkus with or without reactive? Is there anything specific that you could, you could give them? So, uh, I'll sorry, I keep jumping in, but so the thing to think about is, uh, first thing is of course, thinking about like, what's the, uh, what's the use case for the particular scenario that you're looking at because different use cases, it can, it can matter and then others it might not matter as much and then also what your you know what your performance you know requirements are because a lot of applications don't need you know the most blazing possible performance <laughs> ever so just so keep that in, in mind because one of the things you're going to think about is you know is my team comfortable with the apis that i'm using uh the techniques that i'm using um and so that that's a factor to weigh into the decision about you know how far down optimizing your code you want to go uh, but the next thing I would say is that if you're looking at what would fit a reactive scenario and what would fit an imperative scenario, a reactive scenario is going to be really great if you have any kind of streaming-like pattern. So if you're trying to deliver a big chunk of data from point A to point B, um, reactive using reactive is actually really easy. It's just like using the Streams API in Java. We have a, a, a great API called Mutiny that you can use, and you can 
just simply just take the data from point A and point B and you could deliver it over, you know, over the web, you could deliver it via something like Kafka. Um, so Reactive is really good at that. It's really good at messaging use cases uh, where you're doing event oriented programming. It's fantastic for that. So there's some of the perception that some people have that Reactive is too complicated. And what they really mean is I've got a use case that's like really well suited for imperative and that <laughs> is easier to use imperative than it is to, to break that up into a, a reactive fashion. Um, so what does it mean in your application? So in your application, I mentioned earlier that the Quarkus stack is going to be operating at a reactive level all the way through until it hits your code. So that so the performance cost of you using imperative is going to start there. So And that is going to be the size of your thread pool. So you'll have to think about, like, for example, if I'm doing um, imperative code, that means I have to have a certain number of worker threads. And I need to think about the work that the workers are doing, and I might have to tune it. Quarkus sets some really good defaults, but uh, that is something you have to do. Now, if you were to do that in Reactive instead, you wouldn't have to think about that because it's just going to execute right on the uh, right on the I/O thread. Uh, so those are the things you're kind of balancing. Uh, and I hope I answered your question that um, that there's, you're probably not doing like if you're if you've written your application and you and you like the way your code is looking, you've probably done it. The, you've probably done it the right way. Um, if you see a performance bottleneck and you want to tune it a little bit, then consider moving pieces to reactive. And then, you know, there's a community of developers ready to go on the Quarkus channel. You can go and talk to say, hey, I'm trying to optimize this. Do you guys have any tips or pointers? Um, and that'll help get things going. And the final thing I'll say, as I mentioned, I've been emphasizing over and over, which is REST Easy Reactive is, does make uh, this even better. So I would look at moving to REST Easy Reactive if you're using currently using REST Easy and that'll, that'll help your performance. Cool. So, and I, I put I put a, a link into the we had a Quarkus Insight episode like in October last year with John O'Hara, which is our performance testing guru uh, on the Quarkus team, um, and he explains like different mechanisms to you know uh, performance test your application, what pitfalls to look for. Like it doesn't help you messing on on your laptop when it's actually running in a single core yeah. uh, cluster and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so that, that one's just a good uh, resource of, of yeah. uh, getting crazy. And I'll, I'll just add that if you really um, are serious about like looking into the performance of your application, you definitely need to get familiar with tooling, right? Like uh, profilers, uh, sync profilers, stuff like that, or like uh, JFRs, a a anything that will, will give you insight into like how your code is actually executing on the JVM. You need that because you you really really can't um, guess your way to good performance. It, it's just not possible. Yeah. Well, so I think you touch, and th let me bring up the next question from Vol because I think this is worth talking about. So very. So I had to cut Vol's question down because it didn't fit. Um, but basically, the question is, or well, the statement is that there are loads of options that Quark has made available, and that they and they, they can be overwhelming. So what I think this and the one we said before, the question before was this, it's we've got people who are looking for some guidance as to, I don't know, pattern matching between the, the, the requirements of whatever they need to build and the various options that you could provide. So that's a big thing to say to try and do here. But is there anything out there already that we could point people at that would help them better you know, connect the problems they're trying to solve with some of the Quarkus options? Well, I think, yeah, I think we, we may need, we might need like some kind of blog post explaining like where all these options came from because uh, not, not all these options, not all of them exist from day one, right? Uh, yeah. And some were just evolutionary steps from where we were in the beginning to where we are now. Um, so yeah, I think we, we need a, some good reference about that. And, uh, and Cle what? Clement, Clement just said he's gonna he's writing on it one. Oh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, because <laughs> well, I, di I didn't want to throw Clement under the bus, but I was thinking about him. <laughs> um, but m my general um, advice would be like like Jason said, uh, go with Rest Easy Reactive because it's a well known, very high level, very easy to use JaxRS <laughs> API, uh, like almost all developers familiar with enterprise uh, grade frameworks will be, if not exactly familiar with it, the concepts will be straightforward for everybody to use. Uh, that that will get you like to 90% to of performance, right? Um, 
if you use that, then if you if you if you've stressed that to, to the max, then you could probably consider like, okay, maybe I need to use raw vertex or something like that. Uh, but I would say that that is probably a rather niche use case for most people. Okay, cool. Right, so we're I mean quite close to running out of time, but let's bring out so the next one um, from also from Dorian. Um, is very related to what we're talking about. And again, it's just advice um, on, as it says, good practice in a lightweight environment. Um, I guess he's mean development environment here? Hmm. Or uh, runtime? Yeah, I well, know. I think either are valid. And, and I think they're connected to what we've just been talking yeah. about, which is it's not an easy yeah. answer, question to answer on a, on a, on a chat. No, yeah. yeah. Uh, so the, oh. the, the easy one for local development is you just... You, uh, Quarkus is pure Java. You can run it uh, locally. You're writing typical small applications, so don't try and over-engineer it. Um, with the whole dev services stuff, if you have access to Docker on uh, on your desktop or a pod, uh, um, pod run, will work uh, in the latest versions. Um, that's a good environment to set up because we will set up the service for you, and, and it will be what I consider lightweight. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's 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 what we see a lot of people do, like uh, run locally and, and maybe use Docker and then deploy to Kubernetes stuff for or uh, other environments for integration testing. Um, okay. Now, if you're talking about runtime, uh, then you should probably look into like using libraries that are not gigantic <laughs> or use a, a load of reflection. Uh, and I have a very specific uh, use case in mind, like which is Jackson, right? Jackson is an amazing library. It it has a huge amount of features, super easy to use, but uh, it comes with like tens of thousands of classes, and all that stuff like really really adds up when you use it. Because for for a, a, a super simple example is on my application, a Hello World with REST Easy Reactive on my computer will probably start like 500 milliseconds without Jackson and 600 milliseconds with Jackson, right? And that's just, just adding Jackson will add you like 20, 20% uh, startup time. And of course- On JVM mode. Right? Yes, in JVM mode, JVM yeah. Mode, yeah. JVM mode, for sure. Yeah. Uh, so imagine if, you, if you're throwing in a few more libraries like that, uh, you could be looking at like something that is, like Quarkus will get you so far and then you're losing um, some of the benefits because you're using like some gigantic library where which you only need a small part um to actually use the features in your application right because no nobody's using e every feature that jackson data bind has so what, what are we um, using what are we suggesting instead well we have our own solution which is qson which yeah. is very lightweight uh integrates build time it has build time integration with quarkus um and it practically has like zero overhead right so if your use case uh, it's simple for serializing and deserializing JSON, then that's uh, that's a great option. Did we add that to 2.0? It's still it's still an external. It's extension. still external, yeah, yeah. but you okay. can use it um, without a problem. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, so I have. I think Jason has something to add. Actually. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's why I want quick little thing. Um, because I so I think the point you're making, Georgios, is just like uh, do do more with less is general mm -hmm. philosophy, right? Yeah, so like sure. always look at your dependencies and, and, and treat them seriously. So we had, uh, this is a, a guiding philosophy, by the way, with Quarkus. So if you ever wonder like, why does Quarkus make me pick the extensions I want to use? And what we're trying to do is we're trying to, to get a good practice that you have a really good understanding of, mm -hmm. of what is going into your application and, and what the cost you're paying is. Um, because like, you know, past like lots of other frameworks, they just, including stuff we've written, um, like traditional application servers, we literally just throw everything, like the entire universe of Java libraries, boom, ready to go, <laughs> you know, and and all the you know gigs of memory that comes with that. Um, so, <laughs> so this is much better to, to be fine grained. The other thing I was going to mention is uh, de is separating your purposes, having purpose driven services. So if you embrace microservices, for example, each of your services should really only be doing like one big job. Like if you're doing like ten jobs, then you're probably doing something wrong because you're going to end up having like 50 frameworks to support those 10 mm -hmm. jobs. So, so go with like simple services, uh, you know, minimalistic choice of frameworks to achieve those goals. Um, and then, um, and then, and then, yeah, just, uh, you'll note and then use 
you, you could use Quercus and you'll have a really small footprint with that. So that'll, that is about as lightweight as you can get. And it's also easy to maintain because now you've got mm -hmm. a lot less code in the mix. It's just the stuff you need. And by, 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 by the way, I can see we are five minutes from the hour and we still have four questions to go. And we actually have a bunch, good bunch of questions in the chat. So I think we're going to run a bit over. Um, I hope this worked for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> well, so the questions that we have lined up are getting bigger. And because we deliberately left some of the bigger ones to yeah. the end. So what have you got in the chat you want to cover? Uh, well, we can take the one. So there was one who says here, uh, Dave Wilson says, do you know of a JSON module that can handle third-party circular references without mixing? That sounds like a non-possible thing. <laughs> so he's literally talking about a JSON that can uh, basically serialize any artifact that doesn't have any instructions. I don't think that's possible. That, like if you if 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 JSON hits something, some jar that has whatever in it, you will have to add in make. But make sense. I assume he means like helpers to say, oh, if I bump into. Yeah, uh, Jason's Ian's little own class. What do we do? Mm -hmm. um, so no, I don't. Jason itself. Could, well, I, I guess they could decide to like I don't know, buy, uh, sixty-four byte. Uh, what's it called? <laughs> byte encode the, the the thing and just serialize it over and hope it works. But no, I don't. I don't think that's the uh, that's possible. Basically, yeah, it sounds like a graph use case. So I wonder yeah. if. Because like if you think about JSON representation, it's supposed to be like a contract. Uh, so like circular references and things like that aren't well, well defined. You know, compared to like a serialization framework, which is just dumping, you know, dumping a whole object graph uh, out. Yes, that too. Yeah. So so you might want to use you might want to use a, a graph serialization framework instead of JSON for this particular application. But I don't know the I don't know the details. Or yeah. you have to design something specific to have this notion of graphs. I'd be very careful though about generic serialization libraries because there's been, you know, with Java there's been security issues in the past where if you if you take arbitrary data and you deserialize it, it could load any class and execute code against oh, yeah. that class. So it, generally if you're making this external, you you want to have like a real rigid contract and some constraints about what you're exposing and and what you're accepting. Yeah. So that was one, and then we had here says, "Do we have continuous testing with Gradle?" And the answer is yes. Yes. Uh, and I'll, and I'll just highlight here one of the unique features of, of Quarkus, and the one reason that makes me excited when I joined uh, one and a half year ago was the fact that all of the environments we have, whether it's in the IDE or it's in Maven or Gradle, or even in JBang, another thing we can talk about, uh, it's the same engine. So all the continuous testing, etc., they they work ninety nine points seven the same uh in all these environments um and that's that's why that's the thing that if you hear people look at continuous testing some will be like oh that's magic i've never seen it before other people be like hey gradle has this feature you can monitor the file system and, and, and run the testing uh or um some other framework has some other dev service setup and they do but they all require additional setup it's not kind of made available to you on the on, not on the fly, but like, it's not it's not baked in, um, so that makes a big difference. But anyway, the short answer is yes. We have continuous testing Gradle. It's um, and it's better. It's better than what the Gradle thing does too, by the way, because like, the, the, our solution is intelligent. So we will detect. <laughs> we will de we will detect like exactly what changed and which tests relate to what changed. Whereas yeah. the build system approach, it's literally just. It's rerunning the build over and over. So it'll do incremental compilation, which looks like it's doing like really fast stuff, but it's not it's not very clever about because what you can have happen is you change a class and, and all not all the right tests won't run. So As it, it does so have that, some just just to be very fair, I, I, I know what you're talking about, and it is smarter in, in, in some aspect. And Gradle's ones is of course more generic and can be used for others. And the great thing is you can use it with Quarkus. Like all the stuff that the, the mechanism that uh, Gradle uses for its continuous testing, you can use it with Quarkus too, but you don't get uh, the hot reload uh, stuff we do. You have to restart the VM every time. You don't have to uh, in Quarkus. Uh, yeah, in Quarkus. So, um, but yeah, they have each their advantages, but Quarkus, the best thing is you don't have to set anything up. It's just there. Um, this one, I have honestly no idea what that status is for that. 
Do you know? So this is Yusuf asking for plans for supporting filtering pycnation on GraphQL. I've, uh, I have no idea. I see Philip. He's he was in the chat before. Philip is the our GraphQL team member, so he might answer it uh, later. I think there is plans for it, but I don't know where they are. Just to be 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 frank, because we had him on on GraphQL a while ago. He talked about those. Okay. Uh, we need a prize if you stump the panel. <laughs> uh, and we had one. Ah, oh, Philip says yes. It's on the roadmap. It's on the roadmap. Okay, we all there's plans for everything. It's good. <laughs> uh, we had one more up. I saw. Yeah, this one. I again. I don't. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. I, use of support yeah, I for, know. Yeah. I know what this is all about. Yeah. So. Um, it, it, well, just Joseph says, is there any extension support like Spring Cloud Dataflow? If not, any future plan on this? Go ahead. Uh, okay, so if you take it, the, the short answer is no, there aren't any plans for Spring Cloud Dataflow like thing. Um, basically, because I, I didn't see much use for it. Um, like before I joined uh, Red Hat, I, I did a lot. A lot of spring work so i love spring cloud stream and i love how um small right reactive messaging takes uh, a lot of concepts from spring cloud stream makes them a lot better uh so spring cloud stream i love uh and that maps to small right reactive messaging which is awesome spring cloud data flow i really didn't get the point of having like an extra abstraction layer on top of spring cloud stream where you just like connect things um graphically and have supposedly have this pipeline of uh, stuff working like that. Uh, I, I think that if you have that kind of need, uh, you probably have to move away to a real full blown stream processing solution like Apache Spark or SAMHSA or something like that. Um, so yeah, that, that's my opinion. Like I'm, I'm open to if someone wants to like grab me in chat and say, yeah, like I think Spring Cloud Dataflow is great for this. Or on like uh, the dev list because uh, a lot of the times our opinions have changed by what people tell us on the dev list and they're like, this is a great feature. I use it in this environment and it's changed my life in this way and we're, we're happy to hear it. And that's how uh, continuous testing actually came about. So um, if you like, go on our dev list and like request this and, and give us like a good, good um, uh, reasoning of why this is useful um, and what you think like a uh, Quarkus could bring to the table uh, for something like this. Cool. And yeah, and by the way, I just saw Clement saying, I missed this, that Quarkus already support the version Jackson has in supports records. So I didn't know we had to create it. That's good. Cool. Uh, Luan says, does Quarkus non-blocking works by default or only in reactive way? Well, this is like what, what uh, I've, Clement and I have been talking about a lot, and Clement is doing like a, a he, he's really trying to with his blog posts um, and various talks to, to demystify these various terms, right? Because I, by reading this sentence, I think that there's some confusion in what non-blocking is, what reactive is, perhaps what a sync means. Uh, so I would really, really recommend like looking up. Uh, various blog posts from Clement and talks from Clement, who really demystifies like what all these things mean, because th th these terms are related, but they they're not exactly the same thing. Like there there's no point in doing reactive if it's not non-blocking, right? If it's blocking and it's reactive, it it just just doesn't make sense. So I, I'm well, reading this question, and I kind of think what he might be saying is, um, if I write imperative code in Quarkus. Is it reactive or is it something else? So, I, or is it oh. basically is it blocking? I think that's what this question is saying. And if that's the question, then the answer is it's always non-blocking in Quarkus. Um, everything. It's, it's basically what you said earlier that Quarkus is non-blocking until it hits your code. So, if if your code is doing something blocking on the I/O thread, then that's a problem, right? You you have to make it non-blocking, or you have to tell Quarkus to unload uh, offload that work to a worker thread. And then okay. this one, I'm in the Quarkus pod Hikari 
Yes. See, uh, in actually, future, the, why Quark is too accurate for connecting I've, I, I've been expecting this question for at least two years, and I am super surprised that no one has brought it up <laughs> so far. So yeah, Hikari yeah. is a connection pool that a lot of folks in the spring world use, right? Because it's like supposedly super fast and stuff like that. Uh, and yeah, like everybody knows in Quarkus, we have a grow all. Uh, we don't, as far as I know, plan to support any other connection pool because the 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 truth is we don't have a use case for something else. Like we, we a grow all is super fast, uh, super lightweight. It, it matches Quarkus like a glove. Uh, so it, it's battle tested. Uh, it, it's it's uh, continuously tested for performance. So we we really don't see a use case to 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 add an extra pool. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think there might be a few things added about at the end. Uh, mm, no. Okay. Uh, yeah. Do you have more of the three questions? We have we have more, but. Honestly, they're quite detailed, and I know we're, we're, we could spend we could probably spend another hour on a lot of these. So, um, I would say let's take them, let's stop here, and we'll go through these ones and see whether we can do work out how to answer the questions. I, I think the seventeen we should do. We'll that do one will be, yeah, I think. Really? Yeah. Okay. I, I, I do. Up. I think George has that one. <laughs> Jay says. What does it take to move a Spring Cloud function based project to Quarkus to take advantage of GraalVM support? Mm -hmm. That was you. Yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So basically, if uh, in Quarkus, um, we have we have basically decoupled what like uh, the actual runtime of a serverless or function or whatever you want to call it is with the the the, the API that you will use to create that, right? Uh, so the, the the probably the closest thing to Spring Cloud Function would be Funky, which is a super lightweight API we have in Quarkus uh, that you can use to very easily uh, write like uh, simple functions. So in the, 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 the most common use case, you would move your Spring Cloud Function to Funky. Uh, it'd be super easy to do. It's like a couple annotations. You just read something return result, that's it. Uh, and of course, when you compile down to GraalVM, and because Quarkus is so optimized, like uh, Jason was talking about earlier, you'll see huge performance uh, benefits, right? But uh, if your needs are larger, like in Funky doesn't cover your use case, then you can actually write a function uh, using like Rest Easy Reactive, right? Or Vertex or anything like that. Anything you want to use uh, can be used as a function. Now, obviously, it will be larger in size uh, because there's just so much more code in Rest Easy Reactive than there is in, fun in Funky. Uh, but you can support arbitrary use cases. Now, does that make sense? That that's up to you, right? And it, it's just really about your use case. But it should not be hard to move from a Spring Cloud function uh, to any of the APIs, the HTTP APIs we provide in Quarkus. Okay, cool. Thank you. I, I think that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, oh, someone, okay. someone yeah. said in chat that a blog for question fifteen uh, is needed. Uh, was which was the, question fifteen? Uh, Netty versus Vertex. I think was this one. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. Right. Yes. That's yes. the one. How help you choose what? What are the good things to use in Quarkus? Yes. Yeah, you know, one, one thing I want to mention about that, too, is uh, with that question in particular we, we didn't touch on, is uh, some of those technologies are mostly for behind-the-scenes extension writers. You know, so if you're doing, like, Netty, uh, you're most likely going to be writing an extension. Um, you know, and then if you're using Vertex, uh, you can certainly use Vertex. It's, it's one of the APIs we, we support, but we, ha we have the higher-level APIs as well. So the, I think Jordan's had the answer of kind of going down the stack. Start with the higher-level framework. And then move down as your as your use case warrants. So that way you, you have like the le the least code required to achieve whatever your objective is. Is kind of a good first principle on that. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, totally agree. Cool. And then uh, I think I want to end on a positive note. I think Dave is saying here like thanks for hard work in keeping Java relevant and exciting. So we'll 
Thank you That's for high, using high that. praise. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That's cool. Okay. We're trying really well, hard. Get, we, we welcome your ideas, by the way, on yeah. all, all this stuff. Like, if you have an idea, like, I wish Java could just do this. <laughs> Exactly. We're, we're the people to ask. Yeah, that's the <laughs> that's the motto. <laughs> cool. Okay. Well, thank you for everyone who answered uh, posed the questions. And I think as last time, with Steve, you will probably send out a, a tweet for those yeah. who, who who sent them with a link to this time yeah. that video. Yeah, we'll post um, it on the YouTube video. Yeah. And Clement says he has another question. I'm sure he's going to troll us. <laughs> yes, I'm sure. <laughs> Pink oh. <laughs> Jason replies my emails. I'll answer for that. I said no, he can't. That's that's impossible. So uh, I, ha I have the same problem. So <laughs> no. Okay. Soon come out. Soon. Soon. <laughs> <laughs> no. All right, guys. Thank you for uh, that, and uh, we'll call today. So thank you. Wonderful. Yeah. Thanks.